Hello everybody, Mike here at Game for Scratch, and today we are looking at a new feature that is, well, kind of coming back to the Godot game engine. This is a feature that used to be there, kind of went away for a bit, and yeah, it's back now. And that is the visual shader support. This is kind of a cool option, especially if you are not um, really fluent with creating shaders. So now you can actually graphically create shaders uh, inside of the Godot game engine. Now, as always, this is under development right now. This is cutting edge news. Basically, it was released yesterday, and it's not technically released per se. Um, you need to build the current code base or get one of the nightly builds. There's actually, if you search for nightly builds, there's a website that offers them uh, that does it for you. So if you don't want to build things from scratch, check that out. It may be a good option for you. Uh, but basically, come on over here to the Godot game engine and you will see here news that the visual shader editor is back. Uh, you can see it in action. I'm going to gloss over this for a bit because frankly, I'm going to demonstrate it in just a second. Um, but yeah, uh, the shader engine is now supported. Now it's very early on, so we're going to see some changes as time goes on to the functionality that's available. But let's jump right into our custom built version of Godot to see the game, um, sorry, the, the visual shader editor in action. So first off, we need something to shade. Uh, let's go here into spatial and we will make, ah, I'll stop searching. We'll make a mesh instance. Da, 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 da. Mesh instance. There we go. So make that guy right there. And then we're going to have to actually make a mesh. So that will be a, let's go with a plane. All right, so here we've got our plane for our mesh. And we're gonna to need to add a material for said plane. Or we can add it to the mesh. Let's add it to the mesh. All right, so our mesh is selected. We've got the plane, create a material. Let's create a new one. And what you need to do is create a shader material like this. Go into said shader material. So edit it. And let me zoom this out a bit so you can see a bit better. Yoink. So one, what you're going to want to do is create the new shader. Now you, what you'll see here is there are two options. There's the new shader or new visual shader. I'm guessing you can bet which one we're going to be dealing with today. Let's go ahead and click that guy and then you can edit it. And this brings you up in the, uh, the flag editor. So you can set here a number of top level properties on the shader. For example, if you wanted to have it do vertex lighting, click here to turn that on. So the various different flags that you want to work with are available. But the key thing that you're going to want to see in all of this is this window down here. And this is where the magic happens. So basically, you can build three kinds of shaders visually. Uh, what we are looking at right now is a fragment shader. So this is basically a pixel shader or color shader. Uh, you can also do vertex shading. This actually is going to physically shape the object that you are shading. And finally, there is a light shader. Now. I am not going to get into any details of how shaders work. First off, I'm kind of an incompetent teacher on that subject. And second, that is a massive subject. I'm going to bone up and do a full tutorial somewhere down the road on creating shaders. Um, but the basic principles of creating shaders apply visually as well. And what you're seeing here, here is your output node. If you've done any graph-based programming or used uh, Godot's visual script, you got a pretty good idea of what's going on here. The only real difference is there is no flow. Um, so there's no, you know, execution line running between nodes, but here you see your output and you can tell that it's the output because there is nothing on the right hand side. So the output only takes input. And what you're doing here is basically creating a um, PBR shader here. Uh, so you've got all the options you uh, have available to you. So for example, if it had metallic, uh, you can set a metallic channel right there. Uh, we're going to keep this very, very, very simple for this example. We're just going to do a straight up texture. So there is our object in the scene so we can see it. Here is our input channel. So the albedo channel right there, let's go ahead and wire a texture up to it. So we're going to create a new node within the shader graph of type texture. There we go. Now, obviously we're going to need some kind of a texture and I am lazy. So we are going to use icon.png. So there we have defined a shader that is ready to come. And you'll notice we have two different outputs here. Um, and you can tell by the type what it is. And you can tell on the types over here, the color coding of what type um, values take. So uh, we're going to wire up this RGB channel out to the albedo channel over here. So now that texture is applied to that object. Now it's not looking quite right. And that is because, well, we don't have UV set up. So this is another aspect. So here we're going to add nodes. And you'll see down here at the very, very bottom, this is where the inputs come in. Now these are things basically passed into our shader. And these are all the various different options you have available. So you can get in like the, the the vertex position of the current vertex, the normal, the tangent, the binormal, the UV, the UV2, the color, etc. And the one we obviously want is UV. So now that we've got the UV map details, we're going to pass those into our texture. And presto, we have our texture being drawn on the surface. Now, if we wanted to do some mathematics, for example, we could also change this out. We'll go add a node in here and we'll do a vector operation. And what we're going to do is multiply. Uh, so we're going to take this guy in here, 
keeping in mind that a UV is ultimately uh, an X and Y. So actually, I got to pull off that one pin. All right, so this isn't really doing all that much quite yet, but let's see here, and we're going to go ahead and multiply by one and negative one. And what we've done is we've flipped our texture, and we could flip it in the other direction if we so wished, which is not going to do anything because I just flipped a uh, uh, symmetric texture on its angle, but that's what the end result there is. So if we wanted to switch this back, all right, so that's not flipping that. We could do this one again, so you'll see immediately flipped back. So that is how you build your graph of shader nodes. And yeah, that's kind of it. Uh, the rest is pretty much straight. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Let's get that back to one. So at least we have something on screen. There we go. Oh, didn't hit enter. Try that one more time and done. Uh, so you can basically wire up these graphs to control all of your various different parameters that are part of your ultimate output. So for example, if you had an emission map, you could drop that out there. If you had normal map, you would basically bring in your normal map as a texture, apply it here. Um, the norm, I think this would be normal amount. That would be the map to actually use. Uh, rim color, clear coding, anisotropy. I spent, I spent that really, really wrong. But you see all your various different inputs here. You can wire them up however you wish. I'll show you one of the very, very simple examples. So let's go uh, on a scalar here. So we could do uh, 0.7. And now I can go ahead and wire this guy up to alpha. And then you see we are at 70% transparency. I can drop that down to 0 0.3. And there you see the corresponding result. So uh, about as much detail as I'm going to get into on how the shader programming works. But as you see, you're basically building your graph visually, uh, wiring things up. And this could straight out have been just a color. So instead of a texture, uh, I could come up here and wire up a color channel. Let's drag that guy into the camera. And there you see the end result. Let's go ahead and apply a color to this, make this like a limish green, bright lime green. And let's take our opacity back up to almost, let's go back to full. And there you see, that is how you could set up a color channel instead if you wished. Now, another thing you'll notice here is there's a couple of grids down here. This is basically enabling you to see the value of that thing. So we see here the alpha value or the color value down here. Now, I wish they gave you the ability to double click and edit directly from there. Because um, right now, editing the alpha is not intuitive. But color, you can pick up that way. But when it's collapsed down, you can't bring up the editor by clicking here, which is a little strange, but all the same, that is essentially the way that you can now create shaders using the visual editor as opposed to actually writing shaders in code. Um, just be aware they're also available down here as an element. So if we go here, you can see you can create visual script that way as well. And that is basically it, or at least all we're going to cover today. And this stuff's nice to see because if you're more of a visually oriented person, uh, this is a more straightforward way and you can play around and experiment until um, you got things exactly as you like. Now, I found some weirdness though. Like when I leave the editor, the shader isn't being automatically applied. Um, I don't know why that is. I'm only actually seeing the shader when I'm in the editor and editing it. And then even then, I sometimes have to like re kind of connect something on my grid for it to update. And I found that sometimes just changing a property causes it to all of a sudden stick and start working again. So I don't know if that's a me error or a usability issue with the new version. But again, remember, this was just added to the developmental branch. So you're going to run into some issues as you go. Uh, but it, it's pretty powerful stuff already, pretty easy to work with. Definitely something I recommend you, you check out and explore, especially if you're kind of new to shaders and you want to, you know, play around and learn a bit what's going on. And this is ultimately generating a shader behind the scenes. So performance should be basically virtually identical regardless to how you generate the shader. Um, yeah, that's it for now. Hope you found that interesting and I will talk to you all later. Goodbye.